I'm going to talk, uh, my main talk is about this uh, transactive energy. And this is what we see as a phenomenon uh, in the future of utilities. And this is one of the drivers right here, distributed energy resources. What that means is people who are producing energy uh, outside of the traditional mode where the utility has centrally provided power. Uh, these are residential customers with solar panels on their roofs. These are commercial industrial customers that are producing their own electricity. And you can see that this phenomenon is growing exponentially. This is something that although in, in terms of total uh, total capacity is still a relatively small percentage. The growth is something that cannot be ignored. This is definitely in our future, this move toward decentralized energy, this move toward third parties producing power so that we have a participatory grid rather than a centrally, uh, centrally transmitted grid. Uh, this just shows it by state. And the reason I like to show this graph is because there are some states that are moving further along than others. And I think this will drive the grid modernization effort. Uh, you can see that there's kind of a divide there between the southwest and the northeast, and I think that's really, and it's, a, it's a, a consequence of two things. It's a consequence of geography, but it's also a consequence of the uh, regulatory regimes and the legislative regimes in those states. And some states, like New York and California, are more aggressive than others in promoting the development of distributed energy resources. So you kind of, kind of see that phenomenon there. Um, a good friend of mine and who's uh, worked with uh, EI in the past, who's involved in a lot of these initiatives all over the country, Hawaii and New York and uh, Minnesota, uh, put together, I think this is the perfect slide that illustrates the transition we're going through. Uh, it's three phases. Now, phase one is the one that all utilities are going through now. That's grid modernization. That's putting in smarter meters. It's putting in better sensing devices where you can sense when outages are occurring better communication devices, IT, and things like that. So that's happening already. Now, Paul sees two transitions, two critical phase transitions that occur. Again, not necessarily through all states at the same time and at the same rate, depending on the penetration of renewable energy resources, depending on the regulatory regime. But I didn't put the percentages here, but I believe that Paul says that around 5% when 5% of our energy is coming from non-utility sources, that's when utilities are going to have to specifically think about putting in technologies and devices that will allow them to manage those resources effectively. So that's phase two of grid modernization. And that will happen when we reach that 5% mark. As a matter of comment, there's only one state right now in the union that's past 5%, and that's Hawaii. Hawaii is over 20%. <clears throat> I believe it's 23% penetration, so Hawaii is leading the charge here. Now, uh, the next phase, when you get beyond um, this idea of optimizing these distributed energy resources, is uh, the uh, market transactive energy phase. And this is uh, Paul's number, I believe, is 30%. If we ever, if and when we reach the 30% threshold mark, that's when we have to completely rethink how the market is organized, how power is delivered, how market signals can control and direct how power is provided from all these third-party resources. We're talking more of a platform or a grid, a platform or a network, rather than a traditional utility grid. So that leads me to transactive energy, because by that phase, we're talking about a transactive energy network. And this is a slide that came from the Gridwise Architecture Council, and I'll just read the definition of techniques for managing the generation, consumption, or flow electric power with an electric power system through the use of economic or market-based constructs <coughs> while considering grid reliability constraints. In plain English, what's that saying is that when we get to this phase where 30% or more of our power is coming from something other than the utility, we've got to start introducing market mechanisms that will allow, that will guide those resources to produce or to manage their load in the most effective way possible to support the resiliency of the grid. So that's uh, that's really what it's all about. We don't ever envision that the distribution level grid will ever be like the wholesale grid where everybody's buying and selling power and it's a completely market-oriented system. We don't think it'll ever get to that. So there's always gonna have to be a lifeguard. There's always gonna have to be somebody that's making sure that everybody's getting power and everybody's getting it at a reasonable price. But we do believe that when we get to this level, 
where there are so many agents providing power that we're going to have to use the market somehow to um, optimize that system of power delivery and management of loads. So, uh, but whenever I say transactive energy, even within my own company, I see the eyes kind of glazing over and it's like transactive energy, what is this? You know, this sounds like a, like a horrible, horribly oppressive concept. So uh, I want to break it down for you. And I see three phases. Uh, and, and in plain English, what it means is that the, elect the electric customer, not all electric customers, but some electric customers, maybe many, maybe most someday, will move from simply being a passive electricity customer that, you know, they, they turn on the light, the light comes on. They, they pay their bill once a month. That's, their, that's the extent of their involvement with electricity. Uh, what this is essentially saying is that uh, the transactive grid moves the customers beyond that passive role and allows customers to take a more active role in the way that electricity is priced and in the way that they're managing their usage. Uh, so the simplest level is simply time of use pricing, whether it's peak off-peak pricing or it's seasonal pricing. That uh, provides an incentive to customers to think about uh, the way they use electricity. And uh, they'll say, well, gosh, maybe I should use a little less electricity during peak hours. Maybe I should move some of my applications like dishwashing or laundry, maybe later in the day or on the weekends. Uh, so that's the simplest form of transactive energy, where you've induced customers to be something more than just a passive, passive receiver of electricity. Now, as it continues to evolve, uh, customers who have solar panels or customers who have storage, they may actually have an incentive to think, well, I'm going to, you know, prices are low right now, so I'm going to use maybe even more electricity than I need right now, put it into storage, uh, and then I'm going to sell it back into the grid when prices are high. And that's, that's exactly the way we would want the market to work, because that means that more electricity will be available when it's more scarce, and less electricity will be used when it's, um, or, or I should say that uh, more electricity will be used when uh, more electricity is available. So the next phase, and, and there's only maybe, I know New York has experimented with it, maybe Hawaii, is the next dimension of this is locational-based pricing. And this is the idea that depending on where you're located, not just the time of day that you're using electricity, but where you're located is going to influence how much you pay for it. Uh, the idea here is that uh, this will provide incentives for places where because of distribution constraints, there's not enough infrastructure or not enough resources available, it will create an economic incentive for providers of electricity resources at the customer level or the third party level. Uh, we'll see an incentive to put resources in those areas where electricity is very expensive. Uh, so that's the idea. And that's um, at the wholesale level, that's called locational marginal pricing. The idea is we'll just push it down to the distribution level and we'll create additional incentives there. Now, both of those two phases, what they have in common is that you're still dealing with a central agent. I kind of compare it to the New York Stock Exchange. When you buy and sell stock, uh, you're not buying and selling it from somebody else. You're basically buying and selling it from this exchange. And uh, the prices of that stock are rising and falling based on demand, supply and demand. And that's exactly what we're dealing with here. It could be the utility. I see we have a stroll phenomenon going on. What's up? Are you, are you touching the wires? Are you touching the wires? Uh, but uh, so basically, I mean, so the idea here is you'll still be dealing with the central agent. Uh, that agent, we hope anyway, in our industry will still be the utility. But, but basically, the utility's role will shift from that of being a central provider to that of being a, a broker or a, a, a platform manager like the New York Stock Exchange, where you're basically taking in bids for energy supply and you're, you're connecting them with, uh, with energy demand. Uh, the third stage moves beyond that. The third stage is, is the most interesting one of all, where we call it peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And that's the idea that you're, you're buying your electricity not from the utility or, or whatever this, this market mechanism is, this market platform, but you're actually doing negotiations or, or exchanges directly with other um, persons on the grid, maybe other consumers. So um, the idea here is that you can bypass the middleman, so to speak, and you can sell or buy electricity or electricity services to other third parties. And again, there's a, there's a, there's a, cor there's a corollary to this at the wholesale market, and that's uh, 
we call that bilateral transactions, when, when two people basically, or two, two institutions, uh, uh, directly engage in, in energy price sales uh, with each other. Uh, so this one, I, this one is the one I have personally the most trouble wrapping my arms around. I'll say, it's like I'm saying, you know, I get up in the morning, I, I go out and pick up my newspaper, and I say, well, I see my neighbor, Fred Smith, down the street, and I say, gosh, he looks a little down in the dumps today. I think I'm going to sell him some voltage regulation services. <laughs> I, don't, I don't quite see that happening. So, but uh, New York has said, yes, you know, that's going to be a phenomenon. Is it, is it Port Louis? Is that what's going on? Yeah. There we go. All right. <laughs> it was me all along. I was trying to. Thank you for MIT, that's all I can say. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what would make a TE system work, a transactive energy system work? Well, it's, there's, there's got to be a method for us to sell these services onto the grid, some kind of electronic method. There's got to be a mechanism for pricing the services. There's got to be a system that I know what the prices are. I'm not going to be an active agent unless I know what I'm buying or selling electricity and other services for. Uh, and in spite of all that, there's, there's got to be an efficient means. I mean, we, as I said before, we expect the market to help this process, but we still expect that ultimately somebody's going to have to be responsible for making sure that everybody's getting electricity and everybody's getting electricity at a reasonable price. So this is only meant to enhance or to augment the processes that are always happening at the distribution level. And there's got to be a suitable set of incentives to make sure that, uh, that people are uh, that want, people want to do this. Uh, and that kind of leads me into something I'll get into in a moment. But so what are the drivers here? Well, distributed energy resources and just this overall phenomenon of grid modernization. So the question, and I think this is a $64 million question, is our customers going to want to do this? Now, this I think is one of the most driving questions of all. And when you look from state to state, and even at the federal government level, <coughs> To be blunt, a lot of these initiatives are coming out of think tanks, they're coming out of legislative initiatives, they're coming out of regulatory initiatives. Very rarely, if ever, do you hear customers clamoring for you know, this kind of a thing. And the reason is what customers have traditionally loved about electricity is they don't have to think about it. Um, you know, as long as the light comes on when I flip the switch, and as long as my bill is not too high at the end of the month, I'm happy. And I'm speaking, I, I mean literally, I'm happy. That's all, you know, that for me, that's, that's great. So what is it gonna take to get customers who wanna move beyond that passive role into an active role? Well, I think there's two kinds of benefits on the customer side. First of all, if customers see a tangible savings, if they realize, it's the kind of the coupon flipping model, if they realize they're gonna see a real savings by being more actively engaged to do it. Uh, there are intangible benefits. Comfort and security, if customers feel that they're going to continue to have electricity even when the overall grid is down, that will be an incentive, whether it's through solar panels or whether it's through a, a micro turbine or storage, that will give them an incentive. Civic pride, if customers think they're contributing to clean energy, they may be willing to even pay a little extra or spend a little extra time. And then finally, joy of use, and this is the one that's hardest for me to wrap my arms around, but the idea is these millennials are going to love their smart app that's looking at power every 15 minutes or whatever. I, I, that's not me, but, but, but apparently this is a big thing. Um, on the cost side, there are some real costs to this. Um, smart appliances. A lot of people, when I say this, when I make this argument, a lot of people will say to me, well, you know, the appliances are going to be doing important. You're going to have a smart water heater. You're going to have a smart air conditioner, a smart thermostat. I've even heard people say they're going to have a smart toaster, although I have no idea what a smart toaster is going to do that a dumb toaster doesn't. <laughs> but, um, so you're going to have smart appliances, you're going to have enabling energy infrastructure like smart meters, but all of that costs money. That's going to be additional infrastructure investment. And then there are the intangible costs, uh, like the uh, time. If it's taking more time to do this stuff for my busy day, that's a real cost. And there's risk. I mentioned location of larger pricing. Are you telling me that if I happen to live in the wrong neighborhood or the wrong side of the city, I'm going to be spending more for electricity? than somebody who doesn't, that doesn't sound right to me. That sounds like it's not very fair. So yes, there's a benefit to providing incentives, locational incentives, but if it's penalizing people who simply seem to be in the wrong place for no fault of their own, that's not a good thing. So these are all issues that have to be taken into account. On the utility side, what we're thinking about constantly is what will be the role of utilities. 
how is long-term system planning going to be done? If a lot of this new generation is coming from third-party sources, that, does that mean that every utility planning process is going to be like a town meeting where we have to invite everybody to come in and talk about what they might think about putting into the grid? Um, how is the pricing going to be done? That's a huge issue, and I won't even get into it now. That's a whole session of its own, is how we price these services. And then finally, there's cybersecurity risk, which of course is the elephant in the room. Uh, microgrids, which we talked about last year in an event. Some have said that microgrids protect us from cyber attacks. Others have said no, it increases the risk of cyber attacks. So that's a huge issue. Uh, just uh, in closing, um, there are initiatives going on. The Arizona Corporation Commission is looking at one that's uh, July 16th, just a couple of months ago, that's exploring transactive energy. National Grid has got one going on at the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. <clears throat> And one of my favorites, the California Rates Pilot, my good friend Ed Kazala, uh is doing this one. California, it's actually an active pilot project. I sat in on a demonstration. He's using this thing called Alexa, which I don't have my own yet, but it's a thing you can talk to and say, Alexa, I want the air conditioner to run when prices are lower than 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and I want you to shut it down. And he was showing how you can use Alexa for EV charging and for managing your water heater. But you just tell Alexa what to do, and she takes it from there. And uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very low maintenance kind of a thing, so very interesting. Uh, and so I'll end there and I'll be happy to uh, carry on the discussion further and thank you very much.